all for coming to the Street Drug Cut seminar. Um, I'll introduce the speaker in a minute. I just want to point out next week we have Bill Schlesinger coming uh, as our distinguished visiting le lecturer. So he'll be giving a rough cut in this room at this time. And then he'll be giving a public talk on Thursday evening in the sub. Um, and they're different topics, so you can come to both. Um, so if you are interested in meeting with Bill, um, I'm not sure, I haven't seen the schedule lately, but if you're interested, um, let me know. Uh, we'll see if we can get you on the schedule, okay? All right, this week we're very happy to have Eric Beaver here. He's a research ecologist with the Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center of the US, with the USGS here in Bozeman. Um, got his PhD from University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. Uh, he conducts research on how um, plant and animal communities respond to climate change. Uh, also has done uh, work on the disturbance ecology. He's done field work uh, on plants, animals, soils, insects, pretty much anything you can think of in pretty much every biome you can think of. Um, today he's going to talk to us about mountain ecosystems and how they're being affected by climate change. So welcome, Eric. Thank you for coming, Rich. Well, I'm really pleased and honored to be uh, talking with you all today. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, and I, I don't know that I um, can hold a candle to the um, reputation of Bill Schlesinger, but I just wanted to share from you with you all um, some insights from the last 23 years of spending time in the mountains and trying to be at that nexus between basic and applied ecological questions. <clears throat> Why should we be interested in mountain ecosystems? First, we've kind of put most of the eggs of our future conservation basket in those mountain ecosystems. Over 90% of our most protected landscapes in the West, in the US, North America, and the world are all in mountains. Um, they have very sharp biotic and abiotic gradients, so that creates a very um, high beta diversity. They provide um, this key element that, uh, or compound that we need water for, for life. Um, over two-thirds of the world people rely on snowpacks and mountains, um, and a lot of both aesthetic and recreational values in terms of both consumptive and non-consumptive uses happen in mountains as well. However, despite all those values and, and the, the reliance that we have on them for both biodiversity and economic aspects, they're pretty poorly instrumented and monitored because they're so remote. Um, some of the impetuses or impeti for the research, um, our early work suggested that um, one of the assumptions that we've kind of shown to be not true, that just because things are isolated doesn't mean that their biotas are conserved. We're interested in trying to identify those patterns of vulnerability and resilience or adaptive capacity, um, trying to inform management and conservation options through understanding of mechanism. We um, helped inform the ESA decision uh, back in 2010, and I'll argue that mountain ecosystems are frontiers for understanding. Just to give you an example, this is a picture of what mountains are on a very coarse scale, and if you've ever been to the Great Basin, there's 186 to 314 mountain ranges in this state. So that's a, it's a clearly a very vast that's underestimate, but less than 10% of these non-mountainous landscapes are federally managed under the strictest conservation. Another reason, um, uh, some folks know the work at, coming out of the University of Montana um, with Topo WX, but just in some weather stations near some of our sites, in Utah, where we reported um, the American pika being lost from the, uh, Zion National Park. Uh, I think it was last week the paper came out. If we look at the weather stations at below 2,000 meters, they have, a, in, in terms of the data from those weather stations, pretty shallow rate of increase of temperature over the course of a century. If we go between 2,000 and 2,500 meters, uh, much faster, about five to six times faster, Above 2,500 meters, those weather stations are changing at 9.3 Celsius degrees per century. Exactly, the rates of those depend on kind of the um, feedbacks with albedo and, and where the snow level is, but in some places in the world, those high elevation systems are changing quite rapidly. 
Um, going back even to the 19th century, we know that climate shapes distributions of many mammal species from Merriam, Grinnell, and Hall. And we have, in some cases, some amazingly detailed field notes from as early as the, ninth, the earliest part of the 20th century and even before then. And I guess some work um, from Yolo, uh, sorry, Yosemite shows that one assumption that species are going to move all the same direction the same way um, has been proven through a number of studies of birds, mammals, and other um, plants as well, that there's quite a diversity of how species are responding. In Yosemite, this transect that was um, explicitly designed to span elevations, they found uh, six different species that actually expanded their range, distributional, and uh, sorry, elevational range, and the hatched bars show where the species existed elevationally in the 1910s, and then these <clears throat> green, red areas show where it's either expanded or contracted. So you see quite a diversity. Some increase on the upper end. Some species increase their distribution on the bottom end. Some species contracted from the bottom up. Some species contracted from the top down. In some cases, both ways to a, a very narrow range. And a bunch of species showed relatively little change whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, going back to paleo time, species have exhibited quite a diversity of responses as well, both in terms of the uh, change in the size of the geographic range from the pre-glacial to the glacial period. Um, a lot of species ranges stayed about the same. Some became much, much larger. This is a, a natural log scale. Um, some species became much smaller in their range. Um, how far do they move? That the, the centroid up to 3,000 or 2,500 excuse me, 3,000 kilometers, which way did they go? It's not, not always north or south. It depended um, on the species all over the map, and really in both periods, from the pre-glacial to the glacial. And they, these are weird how they kind of con uh, describe those transitions, but it's very striking that species are all over the map and have been. Um, I think an important soapbox that I've been beating the drum on for a long time is really important to understand mechanisms in terms of species and system responses. Uh, a, a paper in 2012 asked, how does climate change cause extinction? They found worldwide only seven papers that provided a strong mechanistic link of local extinctions to one or more aspects of climate change. Um, <clears throat> only three of, so three of those were abiotic and then um, kind of across all of these things, whether it's population declines, local extinctions, or climatic oscillation impacts, most frequently they suggested that these, these effects are being mediated indirectly via species interactions, food supplies, habitat loss, and pathogens. And I think it's just so important that we, this was actually the, the thread for a book that we had published uh, a few years ago. Not only because we're curious, but that is the information that we need in terms of informing climate adaptation, mitigation, management, and conservation strategies. So specifically for montane dwelling species, uh, here's a few of them that we've um, been investigating for species in those regions. Mediated through food abundance or quality, through habitat fragmentation, through kind of this raising of the thermoisocline in those mountains, where that the, a, a given temperature is just being pushed higher up the mountain over the, over the years. Could be mediated through disease, pests, and parasites, like the chytrid fungus for amphibians, through competitors and predators, um, and then obviously physical conditions, and then potentially directly through by exceeding narrow physiological tolerances. Just to give you an example, for of summer heat stress, we put sensors down in the exact interstice in talus that they live in, and the places where they remain never get above these temperatures that are lethal for the species. This is work in the 1960s and 70s. If you keep them in a cage above the talus, these are the temperatures that they died at. Um, so some really strong inference that there is that thermal sensitivity. Interestingly, if you don't keep them in a cage, um, obviously, that's not going to happen, so they use this behavioral thermoregulation to shuttle above and below the surface. 
Um, in contrast, the temperatures down in those spaces where they used to live um, but, but are now extinct from, they get temperatures that are often above those thresholds. Uh, another mechanism is winter cold stress. Um, in spite of that, the research that found them to be sensitive to heat, um, we also found that all of the places that they remain, or most of them remain where they remain, have this long period of um, continuous snow cover where the, the sensors stay right about zero because of that snow cover and well insulated. In contrast, most of the places where they're lost from, you never see a period of, of, of snow cover where that temperature stays at zero. So I'm going to argue that this species is a great uh, and inexpensive model to understand a lot of the dynamics and basic ecological principles and theories in mountain ecosystems. They have this large geographic range, both latitudinally and longitudinally, so that encompasses a lot of climatic variability. Um, they have relatively short dispersal distances within a given um, year. So that led to what used to be considered 36 subspecies, and those were coalesced into five lineages. This may change again down the road with genomic techniques. Um, there's a complete paleo record that shows us that across these glacial and interglacial cycles, the distribution waxed and waned. And then they've really been kind of described as the mammalian model for uh, metapopulation dynamics, sort um, one model for source sink dynamics, um, island biogeography theory, stepping stone dynamics, and other things. So on a practical sense, I thought I would give you guys a good chuckle that they were voted second cutest mammal of North America in an online. So is there any better justification for research? <laughs> um, the striking piece, and the, really the disturbing um, part about that is the first cutest mammal was the polar bear. Amazing, but if you've ever seen them in action, not necessarily cute. <laughs> um, so practical considerations. Um, in terms of, say, compared to wolverines or lynx, where they can be locally abundant, so it gives us enough power, statistical power, to understand what's happening and what's driving these patterns. <clears throat> and also, as, compo uh, as compared to microteens, they don't have this real strong boom and bust cycle, so they're relatively stable population sizes because of their territoriality, so that, again, helps us to, to dis distinguish signal from noise. Highly, highly detectable um, at the right time of the day and year. And uh, another game changer is that their habitat, in a physical sense, in living in taluses, last I checked, no one's using talus slopes for condos, houses, or anything else. Um, so th this is a unique opportunity to look at what's going on in the absence when it's not confounded by habitat change. And so we do, it appears that we do have some um, changing distribution that allows us to see why is that happening. So here are the evidences that we use to tell us that they're present. Unless you're Nietzsche, if you see the animal, it is there. Like uh, Joe here, if you hear them call, <coughs> um, they're there. And then they defend these active hay piles. And this essentially is their insurance policy that allows them to overwinter because they're active year-round. They don't migrate out, and they don't hibernate. And the really interesting part, and you know you're a biologist when, you get excited about looking at fecal pellets, but this, this species is one of few that allows, allows the simultaneous assessment of where they are and where they used to be in the same survey. So these pellets can last up to decades or even centuries, especially centuries if they're in wood rat middens, and these old hay piles can persist for decades as well. And we've put a bunch of sensors out across um, several, actually, really across the west. In one region, we've put some uh, two meters above the ground to um, calibrate with <coughs> gridded data that uses those uh, weather station screen heights. We put some of them above the talus. We put out some physiological models with copper and um, uh, <coughs> look, that look like um, the species. And then we put them down in those talus interstices, both where they are now and where they used to be. So just to give you a sense of one of the regions, I'll just kind of pull the lens out later. And this is the hydrographic Great Basin, about 100 million acres. Uh, we have four periods of sampling, going back to 1898 
and then work in the 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s. So these, the red places, the red stars are the places, the sites from which they've been lost um, up through 1999. The blue stars are the sites from which they've been lost after 1999. And the blue and green circles are where they are now. And the yellow um, squares are where they existed um, paleontologically or historically. Uh, far back, archaeologically, excuse me. Um, so between those periods, then, we can have some assessments of change. Six extinction, local extinctions, about once every 11 years, up through 1999. And then four additional extinctions in this relatively short period at a, about five times faster rate. And we saw no additional extirpations among the original 25 sites, but five out of the nine new sites um, are extirpated, and we don't, we're using radiocarbon dating to see when they were lost from those sites. So just to get your thinking caps on, I'm going to show you four pictures of sites that they remain in, and that they have persisted, and then four sites from which they've been lost, and I want to get your um, wheels turning in your mind of what, why you think this is happening. So here's where they've remained, the Sierra Nevada, uh, <clears throat> northeastern Nevada, also in northeastern Nevada. So here are the sites from which they've been lost. Northeastern California, Nevada-California border, south or the central part of the state, in central Nevada. And a subspecies was actually described from this portion of the talus patch right here. So, and if you were thinking that greenness has anything to do with it, um, that, that is a, a relationship that turned out to be true. So as you increase um, NDVI or, or productivity, uh, an in index of productivity, the density in the 2000 surveys went up. Pretty strong relationship there, we found. <clears throat> and one of the reasons that we've kind of had to go to this um, comparison of evidence in, in support of competing alternative hypotheses is that every hypothesis that we've had has been failed to be rejected or supported by our data. Um, so it turns out that the places where they've been lost from have more days when it's really, really hot down in those, those interstices. They have a, a warmer kind of chronic um, stress across all of summer, five Celsius degrees warmer. Fewer days that there's snow cover and insulation, and consequently more days when it's quite cold underneath the talus. Those are interesting symbols. Um, <clears throat> um, kind of a, a fundamental question that we've asked is folks talk about climate change as being the, the challenge here. And so we ask kind of this basic ecological evolutionary question. Is the magnitude of change in biologically relevant climate parameters what governs the pattern of loss? Or is it instead kind of a species status? In other words, for the latter case, species that, um, that were kind of the hottest and driest to begin with, that's where they were lost from. The form one, where it's the magnitude of change, that assumes that every population is locally adapted. And so this is, I think, a question that uh, needs to be re-asked in a lot of systems, but we found that climate change, uh, at least as how we parameterize that as the difference between two 31-year periods, really poorly um, predicted the pattern of where the species was lost from. And some of these unrecognized climatic stresses appear to be the most important. Even though if you put them in a cage, they die in less than six hours, it, it was this climatic, uh, the chronic stress across all of summer that best predicted where they were lost from. And again, that cold stress was also um, important. <clears throat> Uh, that one came across different, sorry. Um, another thing that we found is this upslope migration of the minimum elevation of occupancy. Now, those first two periods, that averaged about 13 meters per decade. The second, between the first and second um, recent sampling, 145 meters per decade. That's about 50 feet upslope across an entire 40 million hectare region. And then after 2008, it's been about 50 meters per decade. This is, these are much faster than these uh, averages, worldwide averages from meta-analyses of 6.1 meters per decade or 11 meters per decade. 
Another um, kind of rule that we, the species seems to be breaking is that the factors governing the pattern of loss have changed dramatically um, between one period to the next. Um, we just, li I just listed using the same and, and information theoretic framework using the same models and the same sites, which are the predictors here that best, these are ranked in terms of best, most predictive to least predictive, what is their relative rank between the, in the 20th century as compared to after 1999. The ones in blue are the climatic predictors. You can see that we have a very dramatic change in the relative ranking of those predictors in less than a decade. And again, just to kind of note to you that we've done this in this multiple working hypothesis framework where we really unified aspects of biogeography, climate, and direct anthropogenic um, mechanisms. Similarly for abundance, pretty much as much change in the ranking of these uh, same predictors, same models for the same sites between the 1990s and the 2000s in terms of abundance of this species at the site. Another, another one that kind of breaks the rules is the amount of habitat going out there in situ and counting the number of home rangers that are there was the poorest predictor of abundance. Uh, and that bodes not well for these models, wildlife habitat relationships where you say, okay, how much ponderosa pine forest is there? That tells us where a certain species can be. That assumption is obviously going to vary across species how good that is. Another one uh, kind of a, an assumption that we're testing is, are species climate change winners or losers? Uh, in mainland regions, in this case, in terms of island biogeography, the Sierra Nevada and Rocky Mountains are considered the mainlands. We see relatively low rates of extirpation from historic sites. So in, in the Massif, Sierra Nevada Massif, about 5%, and around 3 to 6% in the Southern Rockies. And we would say this is a winner. Um, and then between them, we have about 45% loss there, uh, gone from 75% in Cedar Breaks National Monument, and gone altogether from all sites in Zion. And some other work similarly has found similar numbers. We would think this is a loser. So which, which is it? It's really both, I would argue. And I think that's going to be kind of the the more likely common situation across species. Um, the one that I just mentioned earlier, kind of a lot of folks from all different kinds of agencies across the West. Um, the, the only thing I wanted to mention from that, um, and that was again in the, the hydrographic Great Basin, Northeastern California and Utah. And the, one of the neat new things is that we've kind of put together a class of evidence that allows us to interpret how long ago, in a relative sense, how long ago they were there um, at, at these places that they no longer are at. And now we're using radiocarbon dating to date the um, plant fragments within those fecal pellets to, to calibrate what the number of years ago those various types of evidences were. Um, in terms of drought, we're, uh, this is a big issue for a lot of the West. Um, we've looked at, okay, what is the low elevation boundary and how does that change um, within sites relative to our last sampling at those sites? Um, <clears throat> after a very heavy winter, uh, of a heavy snow winter, in the next year of sampling, we saw that they only retracted upslope at one site, but they actually moved downslope at four sites and stayed the same at three sites. Um, in this, kind of after that year, the next winter was, um, very, very dry, they moved downslope at none and upslope at five sites, and kind of overall across the basin moving upslope. Similarly, um, the, the summer of 2012 was part of that drought time, and we had um, those population sizes were just over half of what they were in the previous sampling, kind of paired with within sites. And then in the heavier rain year, they were 137% of the earlier uh, population sizes. So this is something that I'm really excited about here. We're looking at relative humidity and derivatives of it, vapor pressure deficit, dew points, and some measures like that. 
to assess whether that actually gives us in this that region there a better understanding of where the species is being lost from than these measures of temperature. And it turns out in the first year of data, they really strongly predicted that the year-round relative humidity where pikas remained versus where they were lost from. About a 23% absolute difference in those. And so we kind of put together a suite of kind of based on um, life history characteristics, what are some measures that might give us an understanding of which of those mechanisms is most, most strongly influencing patterns of distributional change. We're also trying out to see if, if, it, if there is a, a plant-mediated signal happening here as well. We're looking at the chemistry um, at two, two hierarchical scales, both at extirpated sites as compared to the chemistry and expanse sites, and then in preferred species versus non-preferred plant species, which the species is positively associated with these preferred species. So comparing the percent water in the leaves of a given plant species with across sites, where we do see some significant differences in those, and we're in the midst of analyzing that. In terms of percent water, percent nitrogen, Wolford Brimley's roughage, and percent fiber for your oatmeal, phenolics, and potentially looking at limiting micronutrients. If folks have some ideas about what, what micronutrients might be important for um, lagomorphs um, from any aspect of biology, I'd love to hear that, because this is not my expertise. Now, some folks know about nutrients in this room. Um, in terms of species distribution models, we're also raising our hand and willing to call baloney on some of the assumptions that go on there. Um, for this species, it doesn't move like a kilometer is a big deal for this species. And as you can see, it extends across most of Western North America. To assume that the same climatic variables and the same functional forms dominate those relationships across that whole area. So for example, the same thing is going on in New Mexico as opposed to up in British Columbia, A, seems a little bit um, preposterous to us. And so we're trying, um, using some hypothesized mechanisms that we've kind of hashed out, try to see whether, um, that again, given that life history attributes, can we use a, a several different analytical techniques to say, okay, if we, if we allow them to vary spatially, which factors seem to be governing patterns of distribution across the range? Funny enough, in this dry region, uh, summer precipitation is the strongest, seems to be the strongest factor here. Down in the south, you see a predominance of summer temperature, and a lot more of the blue and um, purple, especially the purple, in the northern portion of their range. So um, we're still in the midst of this work, but um, pretty excited about this, because I think this could really be a game changer for how folks do species distribution models. And just as a kind of one of our initial tests that said, yeah, we should really do this, in terms of the entire western U.S., here are the factors that most of these, the bioclimb variables that most strongly predict um, the, the distributional patterns. You see very little overlap between the, you know, as compared to what's going on in the Great Basin, very different variables that are important there. <clears throat> Some work that just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago in global change biology, we've looked at this rather than just using correlations to understand where the species is, to really think about the biology and the topography of how climate is affecting species in a mechanistic model of, of distribution. And this, this map then shows a map of the predicted number of surface um, of hours across all of the summer that the species would be predicted to be surface active. So that allows you for access to mates, ability to forage, and do all of um, all those other uh, things above the surface of the talus. And so up here in the Northern Rockies, we're kind of in this really nice sweet spot here. And if we just compare the number of activity hours at the sites in the Great Basin where they remain, significantly higher than those places where they've been lost from. So yet another possibility uh, of a mechanism here. And what's cool is that we actually, in this paper, we um, both 
forecasted into the future and hindcasted back into um, various um, geological epochs, the early Holocene, the last glacial maximum. We have pretty strong ability to, to um, predict kind of hindcasting with our understanding to where these these fossils have been found, and there's pretty strong correspondence of the suitability, predicted suitability of various models, you know, whether it's including some aspects of, of uh, cold stress as well. Another thing that kind of is exciting, really exciting to me, but also um, disturbing in a sense, is where I ha we had worked with a, a guy who actually put cameras on the bottoms of planes. He flew over our site where we had temperatures in the ground, we're trying to calibrate the, uh, I think it's called the radiant skin temperature, the temperature at the surface of the Earth that these cameras are um, sensing and calibrating those to our sensors to ideally to create this predictive model of where the species would occupy on the landscape. So we have like four centimeter resolution imagery across thousands of kilometers that he flew of true color, color, and then thermal infrared. Um, where, so essentially we're trying to figure out, okay, what are the places that are, and this is actually absolute temperature, not relative. So pretty exciting um, stuff there. Um, some work that my postdoc is doing is looking with structure for motion um, and satellite imagery. And Aaron Johnson is really leading the charge on this and some of this, this these new data from Worldview 3 show like if you use the one meter or two meter resolution NAEP imagery, you can't quite nearly get the same kind of understanding as you can with this Worldview 3 data that are 30 centimeters resolution. <clears throat> He's also using LIDAR to try to understand um, both classify areas that have talus and then try to understand where these micro refugia are on the landscape as well. And you can see here, up in, up in this picture here, that this is an effort to really characterize this topographically very complex landscape using um, surface roughness. And this is, gives us, in this case, this was used for landslide analysis, and it did a pretty good job of doing that. And using e-cognition, kind of in, in an object-based image analysis, to understand what are the characteristics, landscape characteristics that do and don't support this and other species? And this is, he's actually, um, he and others have extended this to um, habitat and connectivity modeling using LIDAR at very high resolutions. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to escape out, you say? Yep, okay. okay, and go to this one. And this is just, um, to me, a, a amazing demonstration of the power of, of LIDAR. This is from LIDAR data, and this is actually, you're actually going through a real forest um, and what exists at various levels in the canopy. Uh, the LIDAR is able to penetrate through that upper, upper layers of the canopy, and so this is actually empirical data from the, uh, a, a, a LIDAR flown area. And it, it, to me, it's pretty, it's pretty neat um, technology to give you quite a lot of information at lots of scales of, uh, uh, scales of understanding. Uh, pretty cool thing. Is my, am I back? Yep, you're back. And so sorry for those that are not here in, in, the, in the room in Bozeman. We just went to the, the PowerPoint for a little bit to show that video. And I'll just kind of finish up with um, an understanding of, of kind of broadening, broadening this out to all species and understanding patterns of species vulnerability to climate change. What are some things that we can take home? And the three um, umbrellas that are kind of characterized species um, vulnerability include exposure, typically um, described as the magnitude of change in aspects of climate, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. But the last really um, encompassing how able are species to naturally accommodate and cope with climate change. And maybe some, some more hopeful messages here. Um, on the one, um, we, we actually put together a kind of a heuristic diagram to help um, 
conservation practitioners and land managers think about what can we do in the face of contemporary climate change to either most assist or least harm species in terms of their adaptive capacity to naturally accommodate climate change. So borrowing from Hutchinson's niche, the, the fundamental and realized niches from the mid 20th century, we've created the idea of a fundamental adaptive capacity and a realized adaptive capacity. And that fundamental capacity is filtered by extrinsic factors such as pollution, land fragmentation, other things. And so climate change stressors act both on this filter as well as on this fundamental capacity, reducing down to the realized so that what is actually expressed in nature. And so although management and climate adaptation actions can directly influence the fundamental adaptive capacity through things like managed relocation and genetic engineering, more commonly they're going to do that through by acting on extrinsic factors. And just to give you a, a pictorial example of this, going back to your high school physics class, does anyone remember what the, the best shape for conserving heat is? A sphere. So a sphere minimizes the surface area to surface area to volume ratio. Turns out when I have a, a friend from uh, Calgary sends me, he's, a, he's a, an amateur photographer but produces amazing pictures, he sent me like 500 pictures. And I thought, you know what, let's just use that as data. So the, most of the pictures that he sends me when they're in the winter, less than five Celsius degrees, look like that. And then, and I guess I'll just show you the data. So when it's cold, 70.6% of the pictures look like a sphere. Um, when it's warm, most of the animals are, are not exhibiting this ball-like posture, rather this Club Med picture for this <laughs> dispersing heat. And this is a, kind of an instantaneous mechanism by which to accommodate variability in weather and climate. Um, kind of, I guess, moving ahead to, okay, what do we do about some of these situations? This is a, a, a logistic regression plot, plot with um, multiple predictors there. And this just shows you, okay, if we plot on this um, multiple uh, predictor axes, um, <clears throat> these are the sites on the zero axis here where the sites at which they've been lost from, and then here are the sites from which, at which they remain. And you can see here there's pretty much this um, threshold here below which they're all gone and above which they're all persisting. So in one sense, I would say there's really no value in doing assisted reintroductions back to these sites, but instead we might want to focus on these places. The importance of microrefugia and decoupling. This is in a, these are the kinds of places that give us hope um, into the future. Lava Beds National Monument. You see this is dry and warm uh, sage scrub habitat here, and you have these lava, lava flows in northeastern California. And it turns out that you can actually fry an egg on the surface of these, these lava flows, 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, pretty warm, but they remain in those places. And it's this de decoupling of the regional climate from these, including ice caves down in, the, in these places. There, there's this really complex topography. Similarly, in the Columbia River Gorge between Oregon and Washington, they're living down almost to sea level. And there's several reasons for that, but one of which is the very thick, like R200 moss insulation. It's up to like nine or 10 centimeters thick, and it just really, again, decouples those temperatures that don't even change one Celsius degree, even in the summer, during the day. So it's very, very stable for these, for these guys, these populations. Interestingly, they're here in the gorge, they're showing a lot of plasticity, behavioral flexibility that they're not exhibiting elsewhere. They're actually kind of the, uh, the common knowledge, or the, the perceived knowledge of the species, they never go off talus very far at all. And these guys are actually down in the gorge, <clears throat> they're actually moving off talus in the, in the summer. 
we predicted that, okay, if they're going to move off for shade to go into the shaded adjacent forest, they should do that where there's not very much moss. They should do that when it's the temperatures are hottest in the middle of the day. And they should do that most at low elevation. And, it, and all of those turned out to be correct. At the high elevation sites, they very infrequently move off of the talus underneath the canopy cover. These black ones are at high elevation. And then the, the high moss cover are the green ones, intermediate, and then the low moss cover, they're the highest and then highest of all in the middle of the day. And we're um, finishing up revisions for a paper in Frontiers to look worldwide, what are the contexts in which species are exhibiting behavioral plasticity relative to climatic stresses. And so in terms of a number of things, what are those in the literature, where have species positively exhibited flexibility to aspects of climate in terms of which behaviors are changing, what stimuli of climate that they're responding to, which taxa are they uh, being exhibited in, how long those species live, and the time scales of those stimuli. So um, <clears throat> across a number of different combinations of search strings, giving us a sense of what are some of the contexts where we can start to be expecting that there will be that natural ability to cl accommodate climate change? So to wrap up, um, in terms of the big picture, picture, species clearly are responding individualistically, both in contemporarily and in the past. Um, I think this understanding of mechanisms is really critical for moving forward. And hopefully I've, I've shown you, illustrated in some cases, that at least Species responses can vary across space and time. And these new technologies and analytical approaches appear promising to further refine our understandings. And flexibility and adaptive capacity can ameliorate effects of climate change in some cases, although that capacity is not um, unlimited. With that, I'll take any questions. Thanks for your time. Are you for, are you against the denial of hiking the endangered species? We're accepted, so it's like a huge. Sure. Um, for you, are you for or I think there are uh, <laughs> um, uh, kind of reasons to, to argue both for and against. And um, from a professional standpoint, I can't really have an opinion. And I think it's important to understand even if, and if it weren't from my agency's perspective on that. So the job of the scientist is to provide the um, objective and unbiased information. And if I were for or against the term that we used to use a couple decades ago was a biostitute, like you, you have, you're being bought out by someone. And, uh, and I spend a lot of energy making sure that I stay neutral to, to, to be able to ask these questions without any color of glasses. Great question. Yeah. Um, this may have been outside of the scope of this talk, but I'm wondering about if predation in your research has played a role if, with longer summers and longer winter seasons. I would imagine that pike are getting made yeah. often by yeah. big predators, and then maybe also with the plasticity work that you were doing in the, the mm. gorge, if, if increased forest cover is interacting there. Great question. Yeah, the first time I was asked that question, I was I was very confident in in quickly dismissing that question. Of course not. That would mean that their distributions would have to have changed in these places, and funny enough, we're seeing that <laughs> now across other species. Um, the challenge with that mechanism is it's a lot harder in terms of dollars per data point to get those data. Um, very rarely across history has um, the, the, sing the singular influence of a predator caused local or a regional extinction. However, um, I can definitely see that as part of the equation. Um, it's fun, sometimes, occasionally, you're out there and you, and you see, uh, uh, and weasels are one of the most common predators, even though everybody under the sun likes these guys for a snack. Um, to see that, that kind of interplay between predator and prey on how that works, they actually, very different alarm calls and frequency of alarm calls in the presence of an aerial versus a terrestrial predator versus no predator. Um, so 
the only case that I'm aware of where that the predation was a strong influence, I think, was in I want to say the Olympic marmot, um, Vancouver Island marmot, yeah, <clears throat> where because of some land use changes there that actually facilitated greater uh, distribution of the predator, and that was a vector there. So um, I think that, especially in some cases, and what's what's neat is that at very low densities, these you know, and the kind of at the range, the margins of their range, you don't see them calling hardly at all. And so you would, you know, my little knitting needle story is, okay, the relative cost of that announcement of territorial defense is too much in terms of predation defense, where there's relatively low densities, as compared to how much value you get out of announcing your territory to other con specifics. So um, in the gorge, I think, um, that's a great question specifically. I think that the Pacific Northwestness of those forests, just massive amounts of biomass, super complex biophysically. I think that kind of going back to the earlier ecology stuff, that the uh, physical complexity of those habitats allows them to evade predation mm -hmm. a lot of times. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Are you seeing any signs of like physiological adaptation or just mostly behavior? Great question there. Um, um, uh, there's a kind of a lot of sides to that. We've tried um, putting them in respiration res uh, chambers to see if their respiration rate goes up in, in more stressful situations. Although you could put them in cages and let them die in the 60s. <laughs> Not really able to do that now. <laughs> Um, for, for better um, or worse, depending on the perspective. So, um, so you know, we can't really push them to that to the limit to see at these high, high, highest temperatures what happens. Strikingly, you see that metabolic rate go up at the lowest temperatures when they're getting cold stressed. But we, even as high as I think 28 or 30 Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, we didn't see that again increase in metabolic rate. That was um, one piece there. With, with the, the chemistry of the, the, the plants, that's another kind of physiological approach that we're looking at. Then another one is almost more of a morphological piece. Um, these places that are hotter and drier climates, the body size actually is smaller. And you know you're a biologist when you get excited about the fact that wood rats, looking at their fecal pellet diameters across climatic eras, you see that they're their body, and that we assume that um, diameter of the fecal pellet corresponded with their body size, their body size increased and decreased over these glacial and interglacial cycles. And so pikas as well are smaller in the places that are higher, hotter and drier. So those are a couple of examples there. And um, I think more, more, a lot more work needs to be done. Yeah. Um, how capable are they of, of dispersing to I, you know, re reestablishing themselves in places where they've lost, been lost, and are there any places that they haven't been before that they could be suitable to? Great question. Um, and I, I kind of explain this as the one-two punch. The places that are most physiologically stressful are also the places where they exhibit the lowest dispersal capacity. Um, so once they're lost, it's hard for the species to come back in from an adjacent patch. Um, but that's, you know, say in Grand Teton or in Glacier, their dispersal capacity is much, much higher. Um, so, for example, in the Great Basin, we use an extremely conservative um, approach to assert local extinction. We say not only is the patch that they were found on are they gone from, but all talus patches within a three-kilometer radius, which is probably the upper end of dispersal capacity for an individual across a decade, um, all of them, they're gone from all of that area, which that area corresponds to, in the middle of NFL season, 5,283 NFL fields with football, uh, with end zones. So a massive area for one site. Um, when we see an extirpation, that um, occupancy history goes from 111, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We're not seeing them come back, even though those are huge areas. 
So are those all the ones like in the Great Basin? Yeah. Are they just all left over from 10,000 years ago, or? Yeah. So again, to pull out the knitting needles, um, you kind of the um, <clears throat> The earlier losses appeared in the northern portion of the basin. I don't know if you remember seeing those, where those, most of those red stars were. So then one interpretation is once you've excised that extinction debt, then they start to happen from the, the more southern boundary there. So yeah, they probably are relics of an earlier age. And now where the, the pace of change is happening quickly enough that whether it's extinction debt or just the, the changes occurring. So yeah, essentially most folks are asserting that in these mountaintop islands, we're seeing local extinctions of species, but no um, concomitant recolonizations. It's kind of a one-way street. But that's very, very spatially variable. Probably is a lot better dispersal. We know there's a lot better dispersal capacity higher, farther north. In terms of areas where they don't exist, where they can in the future, in some places in the Cascades, they exist, well, like I said, down, almost down to sea level in the gorge. They're occupying um, uh, riprap, even, and uh, road cuts. So where you have that complexity and high humidity, they're all over the place. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.